This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by David Lowry. Um, you might Hi. know him from Ain't Them Body Saints from, what was that, SIF? Three years ago? Uh, f- I just figured it out. It was four years ago. Okay, four years ago? Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then uh, Pete's Dragon. Uh, yep. So we're glad to have you back up here for A Ghost Story. Glad which, to be here. Um, is an interesting film because I don't know what the best way to describe it. It is the story of a ghost. I mean, I guess the, sto- the title is literally the, yeah. <laughs> maybe the best way to describe it. it. But anything beyond that is really hard to sort of capture. And in a way, that's great, but... Um, I sort of I sort of describe it as a story of a ghost living in one house for several hundred years. I think and that's I, I feel like way. I feel like that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of the scope, but also doesn't get in the way of the experience. I, I, th- I think it's definitely best seen sort of like with very little knowledge going into it because it is so unique and different. But at the same time, it's like I, I don't even know how you play the game of like trying to get a film out like this when it is so unique. Like, it's been a really fun experience working with A24 in the marketing. Because I guess A24 is a good one to be part exactly. of. Exactly. <laughs> like they, they're, they're, they, they know how to, how to handle challenging movies. And we talked about that a lot in the, when we were cutting the trailer for it. What, you know, how much do we show? How much do we reveal? And we realized that as long as, you know, we, you know if you watch the trailer, you're seeing a lot of the movie in there. It kind of covers a lot of ground, but at the same time, it doesn't capture the experience of it. So it wets the palate, so to speak, and lets audiences know they're going to see a movie that, yes, has a ghost who is represented by a guy wearing a sheet, by Casey <laughs> Affleck in a sheet. And yes, it's going to be in 4-3, uh, as far as the aspect ratio goes, but it still doesn't completely convey at all, the yeah. experience of the film. And, uh, and so... Sometimes when I'm introducing the movie to audiences, I kind of want to set the stage a little bit, and I'm tempted to let them know that it's going to be quiet or it's going to be slow or that it, they might feel bored or that it's okay to fall asleep. But at the same time, like I usually avoid doing that because then they, that creates its own set of expectations, and I kind of just usually feel it's best to let the movie do its own thing. Yeah, I totally agree with that. This is one of those interesting films, especially, though, because it feels really heavy on the concept of preconceptions. Like, and you talking about giving, talking about beforehand, even seems like that's going to potentially sway exactly. people. But the notion of, like, ghost, people instantly think like horror or scare yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Is that something that you were really looking to challenge when you made the movie? Because it's, it's, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about what it is, but it's not the conventional ghost story. It is a very unique approach to what life as a ghost would be, I guess, if you will. I didn't feel like I needed to challenge the idea of what a ghost movie is, because obviously, usually these days, that would be The Conjuring or yeah. Paranormal oh, yeah. Activity. That's a, that's, a great, that's a great example. And, I mean, I love The Conjuring movies. They are great movies. I adore them. But I don't think that doesn't define a haunted house movie to me. Like I think generally they are scary because as audiences, we enjoy being scared. It's a fun thing to do. Um, but but the concept of ghosts goes so far beyond that. And, and the idea of, you know, there's so much great literature about ghosts, and it's usually sad. It's usually very tragic. You know, the turn of the screw is not particularly scary, but it's sad and, and mysterious and haunting. And there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in that concept. Well, I mean, it's, we, it's so weird to think about this, but in some ways, like, one of the best parallels in terms of ghosts is actually ghost. Yeah, I mean, 100%. That, is, that is an emotion movie about sort of that departure from the living, those left behind, all that sort of stuff. But it's not inherently a scary movie, which is, it, it's weird to even compare it to that because like, then you get all those people who are like, oh, it's a romantic Patrick Swayze movie or something we, like that. When we were shooting the movie, we were joking all the time that we're basically remaking Ghost with a bed sheet. And, and we took it so far, we, like, we felt it was so obvious that the parallels are so obvious, we thought maybe we should play into it. So we shot a couple scenes that were literal references to ghosts. Like we had a cat in the movie at one point, but the cat didn't behave, so we got rid of that. We couldn't get it to do what we wanted. But uh, but we, we we initially were thinking we'd play into that even more because for the first 40 minutes or so, it kind of is a remake of Ghost in some ways. It's a very strange remake of Ghost, but it does follow the plot up to a point, and then it goes off in a completely different direction. There are a couple of very interesting concepts in the movie. One of the ones uh, I wanted to sort of hit you up with for me was time. Yeah. I don't know what the best way to describe it in the movie is. I could sort of see it as like maybe a cyclical nature. There's, I don't know, potentially the concept of like all time is like the same time so there's no true time I don't know what is your sort of perspective of time and how did you approach that in the film because it's really interesting 
I mean, that, that's something that I think about a lot. I just, time fascinates me. On a quantum level, the idea that time is a dimension that we are constrained to in a linear fashion is really interesting to me. And the idea that, that technically, there, if, if it is a physical dimension that we're in, you could get outside of that somehow. And, and the, the thing that I think of a lot when talking about this movie and, and just in general, when I'm thinking about temporal paradox and such, is not time travel or the idea of time being cyclical, but the idea that was phrased best in Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut, the idea of being unstuck in time, to where those dimensions don't apply to you. And I love that concept. Yeah, the best sort of example of it I could think of was um, Watchmen, with Dr. Manhattan being able yes. to be present in any same, yeah. time at the same time. Exactly. Sort of like, yeah, as you said, outside of the concept of the dimensionality. It's I, fascinating. It really, that that's exciting to me. I don't know if we as humans will ever be able to actually function that way. Maybe someday a scientist will find a breakthrough that allows you to step outside that box, but probably not. Uh, but as an idea, it remains incredibly fascinating. And as, and as someone who feels who feels a great deal of anxiety over the passing of time, as as we all do, we all worry about getting older, and Absolutely. and we always are. You know, everyone I think universally probably feels the phenomenon that time, as you get older, goes by more quickly. And and so you you worry about it. You see your own end approaching with greater and greater velocity. And and so uh, thinking about time as a nonlinear concept is a little bit liberating. It kind of gives you a little bit of comfort. And as such, uh, it is a fun, you know, conceit to play with in a movie like this. It's it's funny to think about, too, in terms of like things like, uh, you know, a ghost movie or a time movie or whatever. Like, you could easily phrase this as like a time traveling ghost movie or oh, something yeah, totally. like that. Be, yeah. Everyone would be like, I oh love, my God, I love this doing is fascinating. That, yeah. Like, I'd see the shit out of that. Yeah. But it's, it, it is a unique sort of spin on all these different perspectives all at once. Yep. Um, one of the other things I sort of found fascinating is sort of like, as you said, the, the approach to um, unraveling the narrative. Like you really took a methodical approach. You really let sort of the scenes play out. What was your sort of thought process behind sort of a attacking it that way? I mean, I think a lot of audiences are so used to these like cuts that are like, I don't know, two seconds, three seconds long in a lot of movies. So to actually let a sequence play, I don't know, it felt like minutes at a time potentially yeah. sometimes, to actually let sort of things unfold in a, a, a manner like that. Was it, was it liberating? Is it something that you wanted to try? Like, I don't know, what is sort of the perspective about that? It is liberating. I mean, I like watching movies like that. I, uh, I like movies that take their time and that are, are patient. And I have a very short attention span. Um, and I find that watching a three-hour movie like Transformers uh, 4 is tough because you're in there for three hours, and like you say, it cuts every two seconds. Like, everything is just like that, that, that. And so your brain is having to make all these connections constantly. Even if you don't realize it, you are, you know, subconsciously drawing connections from shot to shot every time a movie cuts. And that can wear you out. Yeah, and, oh, most and, of the time I'm like, I don't know what the fuck it's is It's exhausting, so you like lose track around, of it, yeah. and, then, and then you get bored and get distracted and, and you're there for three hours. So I've enjoyed those movies, I don't want to you know, speak poorly of them, but they do wear me out and I have trouble following them. And conversely, if a movie has very few cuts, you are able to, or I am able to follow it far, with far more, you know, it's a much more acute focus I have on it. and. Maybe if a shot is lasting for five or 10 or 15 minutes, I've seen movies where shots last for 20 minutes and not much happens in them. And while you're watching it, your mind wanders and it winds up in all sorts of strange places <laughs> and then eventually comes back to the movie and the same shot is still happening. And things have been happening in it, but they're very minute. And, and it's okay for your mind to wander and for you to go on these tangential journeys. And I like that. So this movie was, was meant to allow for that experience to happen. And it was also meant to, uh, to, you know, sort of challenge some of our conceptions of time, which, you know, sometimes in the movie it moves very slowly, sometimes it moves very quickly. The movie's not long. It's a very short film, but within the boundaries of that running time, it, it ebbs and flows in very unusual fashion. There's an interesting combination, too, with your use of sound. In sound, like in film, is generally we're used to the 
something, there's always something, background noise, somebody talking, explosions, whatever, and you very deliberately have silence. Like, and it's between that and these long takes, there is a tension to the film that, I, I, it's, it's fascinating both artistically, but also just like from a human experience perspective of like, we feel awkward, like we feel like we have to fill time or like sound or whatever. Was that something that really, um, I, I can't even, what's the reaction been to those sort of experiences just because it's such a, a fascinating challenge to humans watching a film or experience a film because we're so used to chaos in our life. Yeah. That, like an absence of that is like, what is going on? I don't understand. I mean, the reactions, I don't read reviews, so I, I understand. Probably a wise decision. Yeah, that's a great decision, but I understand that they're largely very positive for this movie, which has been a great experience to, to know that people are responding to it and responding well. I do know that it's challenging, um, and I knew that going in, and I did my best as, a, as, a, as an audience-friendly filmmaker to, to provide an experience that might feel challenging or might feel, um, you know, very, uh, very restrictive or very rigid, but it also, but, but, but in truth, there's a whole lot going on there. So when you're watching it and thinking that it's just silence, there's a lot of sound design happening oh, no. yeah, that is, sure. that, that helps guide you through it. So even though you have the effect of just sitting in silence for a long period of time, there are these little cues that are hopefully subconsciously guiding you towards the ultimate endpoint of that shot. And, uh, and so I think that helps audiences accept what on the surface may seem like a daunting challenge. When I say, hey, do you want to go see this movie that has a five minute shot where nothing happens? You think Some like, pie eaten. you say like, oh God, that, that might not be my cup of tea. But when you go through that experience, there's a lot going on in that shot. It just takes a while to realize it. And, and so I've been very happy to see that audiences are willing to take that, 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 that leap and, and go for that challenge and, and find that yes, indeed, there's a lot going on there. But it definitely was a worry of mine that this might be too outside of the box, so to speak. Well, I mean, to me, like, I, and reviews is ironic to have like a film related website that does reviews and whatever, but I, th I have such a challenge with them because of the subjectivity of reviews. And it always feels like, well, I might hate something, but w of course someone else could like it. So what is it for me to say like, this is like right. a five star review or a one star review. Um, but like, even that just sort of creates these preconceptions that people head into the films with. And it's sort of like, I don't, I don't know how you can combat something like that with a film like this, that it's, it's, it is different and it's, it's interesting because it's different because they're, I mean, they're like, oh, another Pirates of the Caribbean, woohoo, another right, Transformers, yeah. woohoo. But like, to, for people to see this, it changes their sort of perspective on film. Like, I don't, it's, it's tough to sort of like try and sell someone on it and yet at the same, same time be like, experience this in its most natural <laughs> totally. state. It's, it's weird. I mean, I, with a film like this, you know, I feel. 100% confident in it. This movie was made for me to enjoy as an audience member. Like, I, like I, I didn't ask anyone else to pay for this movie because I wanted just to have the freedom to make a movie I would want to go see. And so I feel great about it. And, and I feel that there's, a, a, I feel it's worthwhile. I think that people should go see it. I'm okay with them not liking it. Like with Ain't the Body Saints, that was different. You know, I was trying to to make a movie that would make the investors money back, and mm. I wanted audiences to to like it. And I was very, I, I didn't have that confidence with that film. And and as a result, I feel the film is it suffers for me. I mean, audiences did love it. Most people loved it, but mm -hmm. I can't enjoy it in the same way because I was compromising things. So in this case. I, it was like, I'm all in. Let's I'm do all, this. this. This was great. Like this was this is exactly what I wanted it to be. It was That's exactly awesome. what I wanted to see. And I I'm okay if people go see it and dis don't like it because I know that it's still good and that the experience they had, even if they hated it, is a valuable one. I think it's a, an experience that's worth having. And so I encourage everyone to go see it. I'm I'm don't pull any punches. I'm saying, hey, this might not be for everybody. It might be for you, but it might not be for, for the person sitting next to you, and that is fine. Go see it, talk about it afterwards, or don't talk about it, write a negative review on IMDb, whatever you want to do, but it will, you know, hopefully provoke you and yeah. get the get you jostled out of the the doldrums of summer movie going. Not to say that there aren't great movies coming out this yeah, summer, because there are, say, but like, you know what I mean. It's fun to see yeah. Transformers every now and then, yeah. but for sure, like... All Transformers all the time is like a nightmare, <laughs> nightmare world I can't even imagine yep. living in. Um, 
one of the interesting things of the film is the narrative. And without going into details, um, because I think people should see it without seeing it, but it's a very, um, what is the best way? One of the best sort of parallels I can think of is the notion of horror when people say the scariest things are the things that you sort of conjure up in your mind while you watch a horror film. This is sort of a similar thing in terms of like there's a narrative. It is not clearly like beating you down with like this is what's happening. This is what's happening. It's sort of like probably left fairly open to interpretation. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. What's your sort of thought process in terms of figuring out how much to tell people versus how much to just let them sort of explore themselves and take away with whatever they wanted to take away with. It was um, again a fairly intuitive process. You you know you you write a film and you think that certain information is necessary uh, for audiences to enjoy it, and then you start cutting it and realizing that in some cases you explain things too thoroughly, or in other cases you didn't explain it enough. Um, I don't care that much about plot. I mean, I think it's important. I think a, a well-told story is essential. But when I watch a movie, I if a plot gets too complicated, I have trouble following it. And, and that's fine. I mean, there are some people who are, you know, their brains are uniquely ad- adept at following very yeah, complex totally, plots. Yeah. I'm just not one of those people. And when I think about a movie afterwards, I think more about the emotions. I think about the tone. I think about certain visual elements of it. And, and that's, I'm taking away just as much as I would be if I was following the plot, and I just process the information differently. And so I'm making movies that are geared towards that. And, and as a result, the plots in my movies are usually exceedingly simple. Um, I don't really try to throw too many curveballs to the audience as far as the Which audience goes. Which is actually, in, in of itself, almost a curveball, because now everyone expects, like, the M. Night Shyamalan yeah, yeah, yeah. twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, something's going to happen. You're trying, you're, trying to, you're trying to, you know, to... I, I think that happened with Westworld recently, where everyone figured it out mm, yeah, be, before, yeah, exactly. before, like, by episode four, because they're so used to figuring things out, and all the fan theories proved to be true, because, you know, you can't keep those things hidden anymore. But, uh, but yeah, with this, it was just meant to be simple. We did have scenes that we shot that had a little bit more uh like ru- had had more about the rules like like in this world like what can and can't ghosts do like how do they figure out how to touch things again we talked about ghost earlier mm-hmm. it was again just stuff that was pretty close to what happens in ghost like a whole sequence from defining like the boundaries of the house like mm-hmm. what doors he can't walk through and whether or not he can go through walls we had this whole in-camera gag of, that allowed us to jump through walls with him that was fun and cool very michelle gondry-esque but ultimately that stuff proved to be unnecessary for the movie and and that's the kind of thing you just figure out as you're editing and you just realize like you know Two thirds of the movie is working. What's the third that's not working? Why isn't it working? And then you realize that there are just certain things you just don't need anymore that you thought were necessary when you're writing it, and you take them out, show them to some people. Everyone agrees, like, yeah, this this movie works fine without that stuff. And then you just move on. So it's it's a very organic process, but it really is just sort of feeling it out. I want to ask about the sort of like artistic choice of the film, like for instance, the four by three uh, aspect ratio. W- was there some, like, the, were these things that you just sort of wanted to play with that you're like, well, we're doing stuff, let's do it in this film, or were these things that you specifically were like, okay, this is going to relate to this, or how much of it was sort of like very calculated decisions for this film versus how much of it was like inspirational as you're making the film, or I don't, I don't know. It's a little bit of both. You know, you start off with a fairly rigid plan, or at least I do. In this case, the aspect ratio is part of that. That was like the first line in the script was everything you see in this movie will be in one, three, three, one. And I did that partially because I like that aspect ratio. I like seeing movies in it, especially now. Like I love seeing modern movies that use it. Um, and I felt that because this story was about a character stuck in a box, that it would be uh, uniquely yeah. suited. Uh, it would be a great way to to visually explore that theme in a very you know subtle way. It's it's interesting too because like there's an entire generation of people who grew up with four by three being like their aspect ratio. Yes. Yeah. Like I definitely did. I mean, every film you saw with like the TVs and VCRs. And I was really big at like going to the video store and getting the, you know, every, the, there were certain movies they would release letterbox versions of. And I was always very keen on getting the letterbox yeah. versions because I knew that that was what the director wanted. But yeah, you, you normally would see things and there were so many movies. My Star Wars, like I went 
all the way up until the special editions came out in theaters, thinking that that you know the edge of the frames on my television were as far as those things went. And when you when you see the whole movie and realize, like you're missing the entire skeleton of the sandworm because it was cropped off in the pan yeah. scan version. That was a revelatory experience for me. So yes, there, it, it, uh, it, it's the generational thing. And, and you think about all the old movies, that's why it's the Academy ratio. It's what all movies used to be shot in. Mm -hmm. But now we live in a world of 16 by nine televisions. And when you see a movie that was shot in four three on one of those screens, it's got pillar boxes on the side. Or they do the weird, like, adapted screen so things get stretched. Oh, I hate like, that. Yeah, it's terrible. That's, that's as bad as pan and scan. <laughs> but, uh, Maybe even worse. Yeah, probably, yeah, it is even worse. But it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because it, it adds a, a proscenium to the image that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I like the idea that you're looking through a frame at something that, that somehow really gels with my idea of watching things and yeah. it, it means something to me there is an interesting parallel i guess to the whole notion of being a ghost as you said a box it's sort of like looking through a telescope or something like that so you're sort of like peering into this life much in sort of the way the i mean if we'd really if we'd really taken the next level we would have had a circular aspect ratio yeah, so it'd be like you're looking through the eye holes yeah, on the sheet yeah. uh, that, <laughs> that, could, that could get into that a much weirder darker sort of yeah. horror types yeah, we, 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 that would have been taking things way too far but that'd be interesting but yeah all that stuff was part Partially preconceived, so that was that was we went into the movie knowing it would be shot that way. We shot it on a on an Alexa with a full frame chip, hmm. so there was no backing out of it. Like that was the only aspect that's, ratio that's could be in. Awesome. And we um, we had a lot of ideas that we stuck to, but then there are other ones that we didn't. Like initially, the whole film was going to be shot in wide shots, and no, you know, we wouldn't have any close ups. And on day two, we realized we needed close ups, so <laughs> so we changed that rule. And and by the time we shot the second family that moves into the house, we realized mm -hmm. that the movie needed to develop a new way of, you know, it, the, the language of the film needed to change as the story progressed. So once they moved in, all of a sudden the film becomes very fluid and we used, you know, almost entirely, uh, we shot that sequence entirely with Steadicam for mm -hmm. the most part. It was very, uh, very floaty. It was a, yeah, it was a, it was a, a great experience in like learning to change your plan because we had a plan going into it and realized at a certain point that it was too rigid of a plan and we needed to adapt and 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 that's what you always need to do when you make a film you need to adapt to what it is you're making because it transforms before you as you're doing it that's fascinating um so the film is a ghost story it is playing at sif um but Presumably not everyone's going to be able to come to Seattle to see it. So what is the best way for people to find out information about its release, where they might go to see it? Is there a website? Is there a planned release date that people should keep in their minds or on their calendars? It or? opens very soon. It opens July 7th uh, in New York and L.A. And then the following week it expands around the country. It'll be playing in, in I think almost every city that has a movie theater. It's going to be a fairly wide release for a, a movie as strange as this one, which is very exciting. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, I think there's a website that has just launched, but it's probably the best way to find it is just uh, enter a ghost story into Google and, yeah. and make sure it's the one from this year, not the one from 1981. That's funny. There's another one I didn't even know. So, yes, the one from this year is the one we're curious exactly. about. Exactly. Um, thank you so much, David, for doing this. Definitely check out A Ghost Story, even if it is not your cup of tea. It is enlightening for what film can do and sort of break you out of that box of what everyone is so used to seeing. So I think, I think it's great for challenging people's sensibilities. Um, I wish you luck with this and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. The wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.